You were doing it so well. What happened? Well, well, I wasn't doing it well, uh, Bevo. I, I mean, I was doing it well when I was doing it well, but when I was doing it poorly, I was doing it poorly. And a big shout out to one of our supporters, Luke and Peter Page from Peter Page Hyundai. If you're looking for a new car, head on down there, tell them Bevo sent you, and they'll give you an amazing deal. Beloved sports guru, Mark Aston, welcome to Sports Legends with Bevo. Hello Bevo, good to see you mate. Good to see you too. Now, many years you've been in the media around Adelaide and around Australia. Right? We've seen you on our screens for a number of years. Tell us where it all began. You know, was it through family, was it friends and any of that passion to, to want to be a sports caller as well? Well, not really, to be honest. I mean, I played footy and cricket at school and I wasn't that good at it. I uh, wasn't aggressive enough and I was a bit scared. And I mean, I'm thinking back now to when I was in grade five, six and seven, I there was no there was no sort of burning desire to get into the media and there was no burning desire to do anything in sport. In fact, probably back then and even in my early teens, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I think at one stage I actually went for a job as a TV technician many, many years ago. So sport hasn't really been or wasn't really a passion of mine. I, I, I basically fell into it, to be honest, and, and I was very, very fortunate. But I, yeah, I, I, I was... I was a bit lost, to be honest, um, you know, when I was younger. I suppose like a lot of kids, you know, they don't quite know what they want to do. You know, I left school at 14, Bevo, and, and worked with my father at his gym in Hindley Street, which was a really interesting time of my life. I mean, it was frightening initially because working in Hindley Street back in the 70s, it was a very dangerous street for a whole range of reasons, and you would get the opportunity to meet so many different eclectic people, and it was... Yeah, it was, it was good fun and, you know, I was with Dad. I was involved in sport in a way then because of him running a, you know, health and sports studio, if you, if, if you like. But I, 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 I sort of, you know, drifted a bit. I was unfortunately gambling back then. I gambled from about 14, so I loved my racing. And I was going to the races before I turned 18, you know, as you do. And I was betting before I was 18. And I started to fall in love with that sport. I started working on the race course for a, a dear friend of ours who's no longer with us, Jimmy Eason. And he was a dear friend of my father, so Dad sort of introduced me to Jimmy. Jimmy was a bookmaker. So I started working at the races, and as a result of that, got to know a lot of the commentators, including Bruce. And, uh, and, and I was doing what you call, phantom, what you call um, phantom calls, where you call a race and you make it up. I was doing that for a while, from about 15, just having a bit of fun. I wasn't actually calling a race, but I was calling it sort of a make-out race, if you know what I mean. And I think I sounded okay, and I, you know, taped myself a few times. And uh, Bruce and I got to know each other, and Bruce sort of asked me what I was, what I wanted to do, and I said, well, I've got, I've got some phantom calls. Do you want to have a listen? When you say Bruce, Bruce McAvaney? Bruce McAvaney, yeah. yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and Bruce said, you know, these aren't too bad, Mark. Would you like to, you know, maybe call some races? and get some practice, but not races that were on air. Races, back in those days, we, we called them trials. So they'd be on a non-racing day, and it wouldn't be a TAB meeting. It would just be, you know, so, and I'm talking trots here, or harness racing. So I'd go down to Day's Road uh, on a Sunday, and I'd call the trials. So as I say, they weren't t it wasn't a TAB meeting. It was just horses that were trying to get fit for when they were racing next. And I guess it started from there. And, and I became a race caller for, for two years with 5DN, which I enjoyed. I loved it. So it started from there. Segment number two, now I'm in the big time. Your very first day in the media, Mark, you know, do you remember it well? And, and did it meet those expectations? And, and what was it like, you know, your very first day, day number one? Well, I mean, if, if you're talking as I, if you're talking about me being a race caller, I can remember my very first race that I called that was being broadcast. So, I mean, obviously this is different to working at Channel 10 and the ABC as a sports presenter or calling footy, but it would have been probably 1978, I would think, and it was down at Kadena. And I was, because I was a very nervous child, and I mean, I still am, you know, very anxious. And, and back in those days, super self, super lacking in confidence and, and, you know, that that was an issue for sure. So I wasn't outgoing. And for the, for the three or four days leading up to the race when I was told about it, 
by my boss then at 5DN. He said, you, you're doing your first race at Kadena on Friday night. I was just, I was just a bundle of sweat, bundle of nerves. And, um, and I dro we drove down with Jimmy Eason, who I mentioned earlier, who uh, employed me. He's a bookmaker. And so, because I was still working on the race course, <clears throat> so Jimmy and the crew drove me down. And he was working at Kadena that night anyway as a bookmaker. And uh, I can just remember being extremely nervous about it. And prior to that, during the day, to try and relax myself, I actually went and saw the very first Star Wars mo movie. So whatever year that was, that's when I, when I, when I called my first race. <laughs> and I can remember, uh, well, you stood in those days, stood standing up in the in the broadcasting box. 20 minutes before the race. So the last race had been run. John T was the caller at the time. So John had just called the last race, the previous race. And then he said, you know, on the microphone, he said, and coming up next is race four, the so-and-so sprint. And to call it, and for his first call, uh, Mark Aston will be joining you in, in 20 minutes. So that made me even more nervous. <laughs> and then I got behind the microphone and they crossed him. I think it was Ken Dickon crossed to me. And, you know, you do all the preamble. Thank you, Ken. Yes, moving up for... Race number five on the program here at Kadena. The favourite is single again at, you know, nine to ten, whatever the odds were. Second favourite is so-and-so as they're getting ready to go. And back in those days, there was no mobile start, so they it was a standing start. They'd have two, they'd have two um, tapes across, and they'd have, you know, they'd be in two different lines, six o'clock, six across the front, six across the back, or however many. And I and I just went for it. And I was still nervous, and I can remember now how nervous I was throughout the whole whole race. And I called it accurately. I didn't make any mistakes. Had a lot of self-doubt, but didn't make any mistakes. And then threw back to Ken at the end, and uh, John T was sitting behind me, just in case I forgot some of the horses. <laughs> Single again. <laughs> Akamar Chief. Mark Avina. Just in case. And uh, he shook my hand. He said, "Well done." And 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 I I was very relieved. It was like a weight was off my shoulders because, you know, being anxious can be very tiring. And I just felt so proud. <clears throat> and that was really the start of my media career. And then I did a couple of races at Globe Derby Park, and then I did a couple of full meetings. So I'd actually take you know the the uh, the audio gear out myself. I'd be responsible, and I'd drive to. Uh, Victor Harbour. I did a, a you know, I did a, a whole meeting at Victor Harbour, and then I'd, you know, I'd do a whole meeting at Kapunda or Gawler. And as I say, in between, I was doing two races or one or two races a night on Saturday nights. And of course, Bruce was calling then. And then eventually, I started calling races, not whole meetings, but I did one whole meeting over at Kangaroo Island. But I'd do one or two races, and I would work with either Ray Fewings, who a lot of you were. Your viewers may know, Ray's not calling anymore, but he, Ray was a very good caller. Ron Paps and, of course, Bruce. And that lasted for two years. I did that for two years. And I, and I think I was, look, I made a lot of mistakes. Make no mistake about it. I had some horror, horror races because of my nerves and because of my memory, which clearly you have to have a good memory when you're calling races, obviously. Matthew Hill, for example, who calls at Flemington has got oh. one of the best memories and Bill Collins obviously had a really good memory. And if you've got a good memory, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll be a good caller, but it it just means that you can identify the horses. Yes. You also need good patter around it. And, and you know, good race callers tell a story rather than saying he's in front, she's second, he's third. Fourth. They tell a story. But, um, and so I, I think if I had have overcome my nerves and become more confident and committed more, and it's, I guess it's a lesson to anyone who's doing anything, really. I could have been really good uh, because I had the voice. I, I, I was able to articulate well. I had a, a, a good turn of phrase and I was very good at getting excited at the end. And <clears throat> not that that's all you need, but they were my strengths. And I can remember Ray Fewings. And I was a bit off the rails, to be brutally frank. Uh, that, yeah. that was actually my next question. Sort of, you know, you mentioned you did it for two years and you were doing it so well. What happened? Well, well, I wasn't doing it well, uh, Bevo. I, I mean, I was doing it well when I was doing it well, but when I was doing it poorly, I was doing it poorly. 
And I can remember uh, Ray Fewings uh, pulling me into the broadcast box at Victoria Park one day. And as I say, I was off the rails in a whole range of ways. I guess as, 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 as some young people are. Bruce was totally committed. Bruce was totally 150 com uh, percent committed. And I remember Ray pulling me into the broadcast box, slamming the door, turning off the microphone so the people back in the studio couldn't hear. And he said, mate, you want this job or don't you? He said, you've got to commit, you've got to do this, you've got to live it, you've got to do your homework, you've got to do all these things. And, and I'll never forget that. And I'll never forget Bruce saying to me on the way to Murray Bridge one day, when, I, when I'd initially got the job, he said, you're on the bus now. In other words, you, and I've spoken to you about this before, you're on the bus. Uh, you might not be where you want to be, but you're on the bus. At least you are now being considered for other jobs. And he said, just make sure you stay on the bus. So I got some great advice from two people who really knew the business and they knew what it took to be a good race caller, but I didn't commit as well as I, I, I should have. And two years in, they had to make a decision because I was only a part-time caller and they were going to elevate someone from part-time to full-time and it was either me or Terry Cotton and uh, Peter Smith might have been in the mix as well. And maybe those names will mean nothing to, to your viewers, but the point is there were three of us and we were all calling. And the boss, back in those days, was listening and he was going to make a decision. And Gary Bow, who's still with us, who was our, our sports director at 5DN, rang me, or I rang him actually. He'd asked me to ring him and I'd rung him. I was down at Glenelg and, you know, no mobile phones. So on the, on the, on the phone in the street. <laughs> and he said, Mark, unfortunately, he said, we've gone with someone else. And that was, that was really it. I mean, it was disappointing, but in a way, in my heart of hearts, I knew that I hadn't put the work in. And, and look, I, I don't say that for people to feel sorry for me. I just say that to make the point that if you really want something bad enough, cut and paste Bruce's template. Put everything into it. Well, put everything into it. Leave no stone unturned. Do your homework and then do more. If you want to be the best, which Bruce is, um, then do more work than anyone else. And, and I was... You know, I mean, I'd had a pretty unusual upbringing and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, not that I'd blame that particularly, but I I just didn't, uh, you know, I was more into having fun and so I didn't put the work in and as a result, didn't get the job, didn't get the job full time. Well, you've still had a, you know, an amazing career and, and well done on that. We'll get to that a bit later on. But next segment, Mark, this one, big failures and what you've learnt. Now, you mentioned before <coughs> with, with the race calling, you, you had a couple of, you know, doozy, so to speak, and, and we all have those in, mm. in media. But um, when was your first real big failure, and, and do you feel as though that sort of set you on the path to your media <coughs> career? When was my first big failure? Wow. Well, I mean, I've, I've had a few. I, uh, I, I was working when I was at Channel 10. I know we've jumped forward here a bit, but when I was at Channel 10, I was involved in, in the Melbourne Cup Carnivals. But prior to that, I was involved in the Australia Cup Carnivals. From memory they're in march april i think i should know that but anyway and so that's a big race in melbourne and i was doing my homework as best i could and i remember a horse winning and i was doing the interviews afterwards and i can remember being in the grandstand and i had obviously i had my um, earpiece in and my producer said okay mark so and so's just won the australia cup um uh, it looks as though look to your left and i looked to my left and there's all these people celebrating said, it looks as though they're the owners. Go over and have a chat to the owners. And so I did, and they're all hugging and kissing, and I'm grabbing them. I'm saying, Congratulations. I didn't know who they were. Congratulations and all that. Anyway, so I did the interview with a whole range of them. And then, to my horror, about an hour later, I found out that one of the people that I'd interviewed was the trainer. But I didn't know that. I mean, it wasn't the end of the world, but when I found out that, it was the trainer. I understood that I needed to know that. I mean, obviously, and this is, I suppose when I think about it, it's pretty embarrassing, really. But again, it's a lesson in, in making sure you do your homework. And he wasn't necessarily a big time trainer. You know, it wasn't a Bart Cummings, you know what I mean? Or a Tommy Smith. He was, he was, he was sort of down the pecking order a bit, but I should have known that. So the questions I was asking him were okay. How do you feel? Congratulations. Wow, you know, when did you th think she would win? And all that. But in my heart of hearts, if it had been, if I had have known it was that it would have been the trainer, I would have asked more questions about about other stuff that was more relevant to the training of the horse. So I was pretty, <coughs> I was pretty disappointed with myself there, and I copped a bit of criticism for that. 
And um, and again, I'm not sure what that did, to be honest with you, Bevo, as part of your question, in terms of, I, I think it may be more, more determined, but it certainly embarrassed me. And, um, and, you know, that sort of thing shouldn't happen. I guess, um, guess it's not a lesson about what you were saying earlier about preparation and research. And it is. It is. And taking things for granted, maybe, and just doing something because you, you, you like doing it and not really doing the work. I mean, you know, I don't want to make it sound as though, you know, all of my life I haven't really done hard, hard work in preparing. When I was calling <clears throat> footy in the SANFL, for example, and then calling football for... 5 double I did an enormous amount of work, an enormous amount. I had to do more work than most because of my poor memory. So, you know, this wasn't necessarily a regular thing. But again, it's just a, it's an example of, of leaving no stone unturned. And I bring Bruce McAvaney back into it. I mean, you know, that's, that's just, you know, I was up that end and he was down there. Well, he was up that end and I was back down there. And, you know, you will get caught out. There will be times where you'll get caught out. And that was one where I was caught out. Well, uh, we'll turn things around now and have a bit of fun with this next segment, Starstruck Celebrities. Now, you've obviously met a lot of famous people throughout your time, but which celebrity really left you starstruck, Mark, and why? Well, and I didn't know you'd ask that question, but I do have a good answer <laughs> for you. So I'll, I'll tell you the story. I was at the ABC and Grant Hedding, who's a dear friend of mine, was my news director. And uh, it was one of the earlier, earlier years of the Rio tournament. Now, you might not know what the Rio tournament tennis, is. Tennis tournament. Correct. Yeah, and, yeah. and it was a tournament that was being played at Memorial Drive in the 80s. And we were, it's a bit like what we do now, uh, what Roger Rashid's doing now. We brought the best. but uh, And most of them came over as a preparation for the Australian Open. And the, the key for us as journos, and there was me, there was Cos Cardone at Channel 9, there was Max Stevens, bless his heart, who was like a little, little oh, chihuahua. Oh, I'm actually on Channel 7. Little, I'm a little with a chihuahua. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he hated being beaten. Mind you, he wasn't beaten too often, to be truthful. And I think Craig McGann was working at 7. So there were four of us. There were four journos, sports journos, and we were all very competitive. And we knew that John McEnroe was turning up. And we, the whole, whole of Australia wanted to talk to him because it was a year on from when he was disqualified from the Australian Open 12 months earlier. And no one had spoken to him since. So anyway, I got a tip off from someone who said, if you go down to Memorial Drive about one o'clock and go onto the back courts, you may see John McEnroe there. Okay. So I rang my news director because he was very excited about it. Anyway, that puts pressure on you. Oh, that's a great story, Mark. You've got to get that, you've got to get that, which immediately, you know, immediately sort of ten tenses me up. Anyway, so I, I took the cameraman down. I think it was Peter Stevens. Again, that name will mean nothing to anyone, but Peter was a dear friend as well, and he was a, a good cameraman too, and he was all excited about it. So we turn up, and we start walking down to the far courts, and, of course, from a distance we can see that there's two people playing and two people on the side. And so when we get closer, it's John, and he's having a hit with Darren Cale and the two people on the side must have been his entourage. And I'm going, this is brilliant, this is brilliant. So Peter starts getting some, Cameron, cameraman starts getting some shots of John hitting up. And then I'm starting to get nervous. I'm thinking, oh my God, I've got to ask him, you know, okay, well, congratulations on being in Adelaide. Good luck in the Australian Open. How do you think you'll go? But I've also got to ask him, Bevo, the obvious questions about last year in, Adel in, 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 in Melbourne, the Australian Open, you got disqualified and he was kicked out. You know, he was disqualified from the match for being abusive. Tough question to ask. Well, 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 yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be. And, you know, most Junos these days would handle that well, and I probably would, would as well. But, you know, I, I, I just got nervous about it. Anyway, so he, st so he, stopped, he stopped hitting. After about an hour, we were there for an hour. We had heaps of stuff. Could have, could have made a documentary on the vision we shot. <laughs> and, and I knew Darren. I knew Darren well. And so Darren came over and said hello, and John was just doing stuff with his entourage. And I said need an interview with him and he said well just ask and I said do you think he will he said I don't know he said I'm not psychic I'm not John McEnroe just ask him you know I mean why would I ask Darren but anyway so Darren so that was like I said Darren went back and then as John's about to leave on the uh, Mr McEnroe <laughs> I called him Mr McEnroe that went well I said uh, Mr McEnroe I, I said I hope you don't I was always defensive I hope you don't mind but I just wondered if I could ask you a couple of questions 
what's your name? It's it's Mark, and I'm you know, I'm like this, you know, wow. Mark Aston, who, who do you work for? Uh, like no smile or anything. Uh, the ABC, ABC. Yeah, okay. He said, well, what do you want to ask me? And I said, and of course, I knew what I wanted to ask him, and I had to tell him. And I said, well, I guess I, I want to look forward. And he, and he cut me off. He said, you want to look back, don't you? He said, you want to talk about last year's Australian Open? And I said, well, maybe just one question. And I'll, I'll never, he had his rackets over his shoulder, and he was carrying a, carrying a water, like a large water thing. He put that down, put the rackets down. He said, be quick. So straight away, I thought, oh, that's good. You know, at least he's agreed to it. So, you know, I stuffed around by asking a few weak questions about how confident are you about the Australian Open and how did you train? I mean, we do that all the time. Don't know why we do it. And then, I'm, and then you know, I'm thinking, oh, I've got to do it. And then I said, John, this is the first time you've spoken to anyone about uh, what happened during the Australian Open. Uh, I mean, would you, sometimes you ask an open-ended question, would you like to explain how you feel about that now, coming back to Australia for the first time. And anyway, he was good. And I asked him two or three questions. And then he shook my hand and uh, and and winked at me at the end. I don't know what that was about. <laughs> and that was it. And so as I'm driving back to work, to give you a, a perspective of how a newsroom operates, <clears throat> I rang Grant, my news director, and he said, how'd you go? I said, got him. Brilliant. And he said, I'll let the network know. Because the whole network, well, I mean, that's how it works on a national story. The whole network wanted it. And so I went back and did my story up and felt pretty good about that. But, I mean, I love John. I, I love John. I, I was very fortunate enough to sit next to him at a tennis function about 10 years later. I mean, he's a very unusual guy, very much into himself, extremely into himself. He was a very good commentator on Seven. Uh, but I loved, I loved him. I mean, his antics weren't necessarily conducive to what we'd suggest our young kids should be doing now. He, you know, it's a little bit like Curios. I mean, Curios is harmless. I love, I love, I love Nick too. I entertainers mean, though, aren't they? Well, they're entertainers and, 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 and he understood that. I mean, he used to get super aggressive. But anyway, so that's, that's I mean, I, I, you know, I've interviewed, I mean, you say I've interviewed a lot of famous people. I mean, I have, but not a lot. I mean, a reasonable amount. But that's one that sticks out. That definitely sticks out. I, and I feel good about it too because I've got a good story. Well, speaking of things that stick out, this next segment is called They Said What? Now, we'll take you back to an incident uh, with Belinda Hagen back at Channel 10. Just got a bit of a grab to play here, Mark. Mm, this will be good. <laughs> and England skipper Andrew Strauss arrived in London, proudly showing off the little urn. They'll spend four days at home before flying out for the World Cup. And Belinda, I just can't understand how something so small can be so impressive. Well, Mark, you would know about that. <laughs> it always gives me a good laugh, Mark. Yeah. I was actually watching good. it earlier on YouTube. I'm glad it gives about, people a good laugh. <laughs> I watched it over and over again about 10 times. Do you know it's had 13 million views on YouTube? Well, on, well, on, well, on that yeah, feed. Yeah, worldwide. <laughs> yeah, well, on, on, on that feed it has had many, many hundreds of thousands and many millions on others because it constantly gets uh, included in end-of-year blooper tapes where a network, and it could be Fox, it could be NBC, it could be any something in the UK... They'll do a show, they'll do a one hour show and they'll say, you know, and, and the show might be called, you know, I don't know, uh, 20 worst takedowns on air live to air or something like that. <laughs> and, you know, and of course it gets put in all the time. And look, I mean, I look back at it, uh, you know, I look back at it fondly. <laughs> no, I, I look back at it and, uh, and I must admit it was, it was, it was the perfect takedown. It was, it was a ripper. I can remember just briefly i can remember us we had about two minutes to go before the end of the sport break and my producer who was then in melbourne said mate we've got a little bit of time and when they say a little bit of time and they'll explain it it's 15 seconds like because we've got to get out on the second he'll say can you just ad lib for about 10 15 seconds you know and we were in a story at the time and, I, and i'm thinking yeah, yeah sure you know and i told belinda so we didn't i mean a lot of people think that we Re re rehearsed that it wasn't rehearsed at all it just happened and so when that clip came up as that clip came up I was literally thinking of what I could say at the end during that clip <clears throat> uh, you know about holding the little urn and so I just thought of that I just thought of I can't understand how something so small can be so impressive I just thought of it but the key to the whole thing was the fact that instead of Belinda saying here yeah, Mark you know about that jokingly, nothing would have happened. Nothing would have happened. It wouldn't have gone viral. 
not that I care either way, but it wouldn't have gone viral. It would have just been a bit of a joke. But because she looked at me and I looked at her and she said, well, you'd know about that, Mark. Yeah, it's really serious. Thank you very much. <laughs> now to the weather with, I mean, and, and, and if you look carefully, you'll see, or if you had to look carefully, you'd see that when she said, well, you know all about that, Mark, they stayed on us for another three seconds. And I'm just going, as if to say, what did you just say? And so as I got off the set, I was taking my microphone off. I was about, well, not, we didn't say anything afterwards. You know, she just said, thanks, mate. That was good. I said, yeah. As I'm walking and we're in an ad break, she said, hey, Mark. And I turned around, she said, how do you think that last bit went? Do you think, do you think it would be, is it okay? And I said, that's oh, fine. Next morning it had 10 million views. So someone had obviously ripped it off us, you know, maybe probably someone, I don't know, from the station, I don't know. And it had 10 million views. Then it was on Ellen DeGeneres a week later. <laughs> but that was the Friday, I think. On the Saturday, I was doing wrestling at the time. Don't know how. <laughs> And oh. as I and I was a baddie, I was a heel. As I'm as I'm walking down the hallway, young kids are going boo, 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 boo. <laughs> you're small, boo. <laughs> Thank you. What did I do to deserve this? <laughs> small but impressive. Work that out. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and the comments were weird because, and you know, I was still with my wife at the moment at the time, which is embarrassing, I guess, for her, but the comments were things like, oh, great takedown, or isn't she terrible, or he didn't handle that well, or how did that work, or that was scripted. But a lot of them were things like, hey, something's going on between those two. And 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 so people started thinking that we were seeing each other and that she just wasn't impressed with me, you know, that under, the, under yeah. the sheets or something. <laughs> well, she was impressed, but it was small. I don't know. It's very complicated. <laughs> very complicated. What was that next, uh, the next gig? So you said you did it on the Friday night. The, the next gig on the Monday, so your next time you were with Belinda on the Monday, was, no, it, was no, it awkward? Or no. No, oh, it, was oh, all... no, it, was, it no. wasn't awkward between us no. at all. No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. In fact, Matt Gilbertson about two weeks later wanted to do a little piece with us together, and in the end we decided not to do it. But, uh, oh, no, it wasn't awkward between us. I mean, I see Belinda at the gym and, you know, we have chats about it while we're standing around in the pool and just <laughs> laugh, laugh, have a laugh about it. But look, it was just one of those things. And, 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 but, the, but the, the point is when you look at it, it was definitely worthy of what the hell is going on there <laughs> because of the serious way that she answered back. Yes. You know, well, you know all about that, Mark. Coming up next, the weather. I mean, it was like, hmm, and the, um, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> brilliant. Uh, speaking of brilliant, again, I mentioned before that um, I was looking at some of your YouTube hits and there's so many, there's many classics over the years, Mark. So this next segment is called Taste of Regret. Now, at the start, you mentioned how um, with, the, with the horse racing calling, you sort of had a few doozies here and there and, and we all do it. Has there been times in the media where you've said something like embarrassing on air or done something awkward where you're like, oh no, I can't believe I've just said that? Well, I'm sure there. I'm, 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 yes, is the answer. I'm just trying to think of. I'm just trying to think of one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was one. So my style as a sports presenter is a bit. Is it? Well, was a bit unique. I don't know whether it is now, but it was a bit unique in the sense that I, I feel as though I was good at it, and I don't say that. You know, I don't say that as a boasting comment. I. I, I, I should have been good at it. I've been doing it for 40 years. So if you're not good at something after 40 years, and I think I was good at it because I, I, I offered a little alternative at the end. I had a bit of hue, I had a bit of fun. Or, or if I made a mistake during the bulletin, I'd cover that up with humour. And so it didn't look awkward. It didn't look like a mistake. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. And so, you know, that's, I mean, I, again, I make the point, I'm not boasting about that. I mean, there was other things that I, I didn't do so well, but... I can remember one. I can remember one night where the last I was with Rebecca, and we were in the. You got to remember we were we were actually in the newsroom. We we didn't have a studio at this point, so you could see and hear people working. People were walking past and not walking past the camera. So Steeny, who was our producer, was not far away. So if Steeny said something quite loud, you could hear him while you're on set. And Steeny was the the, the sports producer. And in the foreground was Grant sitting his, in his office and all the journos and the editors. I mean, it was just in a newsroom. And that's not the same. I, well, it might be the same with Seven now, I don't know, but I think Nine have got their own studio. But anyway, so the last story was one of those stories. You know the sport, what's it called, um, in the water where they've got their legs in the air? 
Uh, synchronised swimming. Okay, yeah, so that was yeah. the last story. And Rebecca was, I was working with Rebecca, and Rebecca was great. So was Belinda. Rebecca had a, a real knack. She was very funny and very clever and very quick, very quick-witted. Really good, great ad libber. And anyway, so that was the last story. And then I came out of that, and I think they said you got 15 seconds. And I said, I said, you know, that reminds me, uh, Rebecca, of that party that um, I went to at your place. You know how you fell backwards, on, you know, on your chair, and your legs were in the. And as I'm about to say, your legs are in the air. I could hear Steenie saying, "No, no, don't <laughs> say that." And and I, I think I just kept going, and it was funny. It was edgy, yes. But it, well, that was my style, you know. So I don't regret saying that, but I know that also the extension of that story is is that at the end of the story, at the end of the, the sport break, I got off and, and, and you'd, I'd, you'd have to walk past the boss's office, Grant. And Grant was a dear friend of mine, as I said earlier. A lovely man. I still see him to this day. But you knew you were in trouble if as you were walking past, you'd say, you got a mow? You got a moment? You got a mow? Not... Get in here. Yes, hi, Grant. What was that last thing you said? And, of course, I had to explain it again. And he looked at me and he said, don't do that again. And that was it. And you just knew that that was too edgy. <laughs> so that was quite funny. And, you know, we, I think everyone, everyone else found it funny. And I think Grant probably found it funny as well, but he just thought, no, pull back a bit. Got your toes just slightly over the line there. And Beck would have found it pretty... She's a real character as well. Oh, Beck, but look, Beck yeah. and I got on well. We had a lot of really good chemistry, Beck and I. And, and I still see Beck. I saw Beck only, only recently with Grant, actually. She's a really good, really good presenter. But one of her strengths is, is that she's very inclusive. And what I mean by that, and that's important as well when, you, when you're working on a team, uh, you know, on a radio show, on a breakfast show, you, you've got to be a giver. You can't be taking all the time. You can't, you know, Beck doesn't want the laugh all the time. She's happy for me to have the laugh and or get the laugh. If she gets the laugh, that's great. But there's there's no conflict between us. It's a very important element, a very, very important element, uh, you know, about the success of a team. Uh, you've got to be giving, not taking. Yeah. And, and so she laughed at my gags. She told gags and she led me down the path of a gag. She was very clever. I, I miss working with her. I miss working with her a lot. Mark, our next segment is <clears throat> okay not to be okay. So um, we know about your sort of mental health battles and, and it's great to see that you've overcome those battles. Uh, tell us all sort of what's happened. I mean, a lot of people know <clears throat> because you've come out quite openly and spoken about mm. it and it's a credit to you um, about that. But um, tell us actually, you know, what's happened mm. and, and sort of how you've overcome those, those issues and, and the person you are today. Yeah. Uh, well... First thing I'd say, Bevo, is that I don't do these interviews just to get publicity, and I mean that quite. I mean that from the heart. I have hand on heart. I, I, I mean, I enjoy talking to you, and I, I and, but I, I, I do these interviews because, particularly if we're talking about this, because I genuinely believe that if I had have taken a, a different path and done some things differently, uh, my life would be completely different. I'd. I'd probably possibly still be working at Channel 10, I'd still be working at 5AA, uh, I'd be with my wife. And, and you know, those things are very difficult when you, when you think back. And they're very difficult to think about understanding that you've lost those things. Now, the jobs, of course, but certainly from a marriage point of view because that was just really difficult for Judith. So I just wanted to make that point. You know, I don't do these interviews just to promote myself. I do these interviews and talk about this because... I think it's really important, and, and and in a way, it's such a fundamental, such a fundamental uh, message that I'll get to in a second. But uh, I guess I've had mental health issues all my life. I don't know why. Might have been because Mum did. Mum was in and out of Glenside. Glenside, by the way, is like an old mental institution way back in the sixties and seventies. You know, there's housing on there now, and and I had a very unusual back uh, upbringing, as I said earlier, and that's certainly not well. Maybe it is an excuse. Very unusual. You know, mum was unwell, I was 13, 14, we were looking after ourselves, I was with Kathy and my brother, my dad was never there, I mean I love dad, but dad was never there because he was working, fair enough, and in the early days he was actually working at, uh, as a, a motel, uh, he was a general manager, so he was working all night, and then when he'd come home he'd be asleep all day, so we'd never see him, so it was a very, I guess what I'm saying is it wasn't a normal upbringing, so maybe the combination of that plus mum's issues, 
I've always been anxious and 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 a bit nervous and you know suffered a lot of self doubt, which is sort of weird given what I achieved. Hmm. But anyway, I guess the point I'm making is it reached a point about four years ago where I couldn't I couldn't keep the mask on anymore. And what I mean by that is I was becoming more and more unwell, but I was working at Channel 10, I was doing breakfast radio on AA and then Mix. You know, I was earning a lot of money, I was driving a nice car, I don't say that to impress, I'm just saying that's the situation. You know, I had a nice car, a lot of pressure to keep all of that. You know, my beautiful wife, my beautiful daughter who was growing up, there was a big expectation from the public, I guess, in a large, to a large degree, that Mark's this funny guy who's got his act together and everything's going well. Well, it wasn't. And that places a lot of pressure on you. And then if you're unwell, and, and I was drinking a lot, uh, to try and mask it, you do that, whether it be drinking, drugs, alcohol, sex, shopping, whatever it might, whatever your addiction is. I have a very addictive nature, very addictive nature indeed. So I was doing those things to get through. And I guess the first message I'd say is that if you are doing that and you're in that position, please understand, I'm not telling you not, to, I'm not telling you to not take drugs. I'm not telling you to not smoke. I'm not telling you to not drink or gamble, or what, I'm not telling you not to do those things. What I'm saying to you and, and your viewers is if you are doing that and things are escalating, please understand that there is a chance, may not happen to you, there is a chance that what happened to me will happen to you. That's all I'm saying. And of course, you know, the mask eventually fell off. And when the mask fell off, you know, it, it was pretty, pretty dark. And, um, and so I left Channel 10, left 5AA, Judith left me, which is which was horrible, horrible for her, obviously horrible for me, but horrible for her. And then from that point, I, I certainly went downhill significantly um, because I was living by myself. I had a bit of money as a result of the split up. I was with my dog, Jack, my beautiful dog, who's, who's no longer with us. I now have Toby. And I was pretty directionless and I was out of control. And it was, uh, it was very dark and, and I'm not the only person that's done, that that's happened to. I mean, I'm not the only person. I mean, this is happening to a lot of people at different levels. And uh, my sister and my very dear friend Brad, Brad rang me, and um, who's still my dearest friend now, <clears throat> and said, let's go down and have something to eat down at Glenelg. So we went down to Glenelg and we, uh, we had a meal, and Kathy turned up, my sister. And I wasn't in denial. I mean, we could talk about that forever. That's a, that's a big topic. If you're in denial with what you're doing, then then it's even more difficult to get out of, to mm. dig yourself out of that hole. I wasn't in denial. I, I knew what was going on. I just didn't know how to get out. And and they both said, we're really worried about you. And what are the alternatives? And within 24 hours, I was putting my head down on a pillow at, um, at a rehab centre in Melbourne, in Geelong. Uh, and when I put my head down on the pillow, I thought two things. The first thing was, what the hell's just happened? How did this come to this? But the second thing, which I've held on to, is this is the start. This is the start of my recovery. And, uh, and it has been. I mean, I've been out of rehab now for three and a bit years, and I was there for three months. And it was pretty amazing in there for a whole range of reasons, as you can imagine. You know, being in a, in a house where we were in two houses. We were one in, one in Geelong, and then we went to Essendon. But, you know, you're in there with 20 other addicts. Sex addicts, ice addicts, criminals, coke addicts. I mean, you know, it's you know, it's pretty unusual. Mm. I, I I felt fine. I mean, I felt actually quite quite at home in a way, and that might have been as a result of my unusual back, uh, upbringing. And there were businessmen in there, and there were people who were home. I mean, it was incredible. People who, you know, who were about to go to jail for serious crimes, but they'd agreed to do the rehab because every day they were in, they'd get three days off their sentence. So there's a system there. So anyway, I was there for three months and um, came out and went through what they call the blue haze, which is where you feel really good. Great, I'm out, I'm on the way. And, but then it, life hits you. You've got to pay your bills, you've got to get a job. I mean, you've got to do all the things that you didn't have to worry about in there. So that was hard. But since then, I haven't used, and I have a job at Radio Tati Uno now as the general manager, and I'm, you know, I'm, I don't intend to use ever again. You can never say never, but I'm 64. I mean, I don't party, I don't go out, 
you know, I, I don't think that's that's going to be a problem at all. I, you know, I don't get triggered. I mean, if you were having a beer now, I, I wouldn't think I need to have a beer. So that's a good sign. Yes. And and I guess um, and I guess it's just sort of sounds a bit cliched, but I guess it's one day at a time. But getting back to my message, my message is that if you feel as though you are heading down that path that I did, if you just get an inkling early on, which I didn't, of course, because it all fell apart, talk to someone. And I know that sounds, Bebo, simplistic and just, really, is that it? But it's so important. And it might be that, you know, you speak to your mate or your father or your mother or your brother or your sister or your school teacher or your coach. I mean, just talk to someone about it because it may save your life if you open up, but I didn't. I just, pressure just kept building. It was like a, you know, a, uh, putting on a coffee percolator or whatever, you know, and all of a sudden it just, and causes a lot of problems for a yeah. lot of people. It's not just me, you know, it's my wife and my daughter and, you know, my workmates and, and, and it affects a lot of people. It's just like, I guess you had supportive family around you and your friends to, to I guess, take you to that next step. Well, you know, with I, had, I, I had two particular people that, I mean, bless my daughter's heart, she didn't know what was going on, so really it wasn't up to her. Um, but yeah, I had Kathy and, and, and Brad. So the first thing is make sure you talk to someone. And secondly, and this is just as important, if you feel as though one of your mates or someone you know, or even a workmate is just going through, talk to them. Mm. I know that's a bit harder because there is a bit of a skill in that and also you need to be careful that you're not judgmental. But again, if you do that, if you go to someone, that's, you know, that's what Are You Okay Days are all about. If you go to someone and say, hey, want to have a coffee? Yeah, sure. Everything all right? I, you know, just start that conversation. And that may save their life because it may instigate them then to say, well, actually, no, I'm really worried about my ice addiction or I'm really worried that, you know, I'm coming to work pissed because, you know, I've been getting drunk the night before and this has been going, I mean, I don't know, you know, uh, everyone's situation is different, but they're the two things that I would, inst that I would suggest that you do because I, I didn't really do that. I just let it percolate until it exploded, you know, and I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't wish, you know, my worst enemy, you know, what I went through and what other people go through and I'm still working on things. And am I okay? Of course, I, I mean, not of course. Yes, I am. I mean, I'm working at a, I'm working as a general manager at a radio station for heaven's sake. I run a small business uh, teaching people, you know, how to handle the media. I'm a great communicator. I, you know, I feel as though I am. I'm a good mentor. So I'm, I'm 10,000% better. That's great. And, 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 but getting better every day, but getting better by commitment and by, and by, as best you can. I'm still making mistakes, Bevo. I don't sit here and I never ever would sit here or when I do my talks to people about what I went through and that little, those two messages at the end, I never ever stand there and say, I'm fine, everything's great, brilliant, this is what I've done and now I'm, I mean, I'm a thousand times better, but it's, it, it, it's incremental. It's like compound interest. The more you do, the better you get. The more you do, the better you get. And that would be the same with anyone, even if they're reasonably well. It's just how life works. But you have to particularly work hard at it when you've fallen down a hole. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, it's challenging, but, I, but it's exciting for me. And there's different things that you need to do. It's very, I mean, obviously I don't mind talking about it in, in this setting, but I don't, I don't think too much about what happened in the past anymore. It's all about the future now. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit, a bit like, you know, you don't want to rear vision yourself in life because if you're doing that and looking back at the stuff that went wrong yeah sure you know look back at it occasionally and and maybe reassess and say how well am I doing if you do that all the time you'll never you'll never move forward because you'll always feel uh, regret or shame shame's a big one uh, you'll get worried again you'll get anxious you'll have self-doubts and all those things all of those traits are totally useless and very, very damaging and debilitating when you're moving forward.
It's great advice. When I got sacked, thank from... you. That'll be four hundred dollars. <laughs> no, thanks for being so open with your with your answers there. And this is not being recorded. I take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, when, when I oh, hang on, we've got cameras. But you know the interesting yeah, thing. The but, thing but, that, you know, that's to what you were saying before, though. Yeah, it's all about the future going forward, and, and don't worry about the past because you can't control the past. Well, so. no, no, that's right. And and also too, and this will sound odd, and maybe you can you know relate to it with what what happened with you when when you you lost your job. When, when when you have when you have the advantage of of time after something happens, and this will sound incredible, maybe until until you think about it carefully, but when I left Channel Ten, it was horrendous. But now I look at that situation and I go, it was a gift. And so what I mean by that is, it was going to happen eventually. I was going to explode eventually. But I'm glad it happened then because it gave me more time to sit here with you and say that I've been out of rehab for three and a half years. Yeah. Because if it hadn't have happened then, I wouldn't. I may not be sitting here with you. I may be still going through the same rubbish, and I may still be at Channel Ten, which is fantastic. But the explosion may even be bigger. And because I'm 64, it's going to take me longer to recover. Does yes. that make sense? Yeah, you're young. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So I look at those situations as gifts. Now you don't see them as a gift at the time. You know, you don't see. I mean, you know, when you lose, you know, um, uh, you, you know, your wife, you don't see that as a gift. But I see that as a gift too. Now that sounds weird, but the reason I see that as a gift, and as sad as I am uh, to have lost Judith, because I love her very much. I don't know whether she does me, but I love her very much, and I get very emotional when I think about this because I, I, I just didn't handle that situation well at all. But it's a gift because she's now at peace. Do you still keep in touch? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. But it's a gift because she's now at peace. And, and, and she's given me an opportunity to move, move on with my life. Others might not see it that way, but I do. And I'm so pleased and proud that I have that, you know, that, that view rather than, oh, you know, she left me, you know, when I was at my worst and, or whatever, you know, blaming. She needed to leave. And, you know, I don't normally talk much about that and that's probably all I'd say about that. But you, 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 you know, you can, you can look back on a lot of disasters. In fact, most disasters in your life, and as as odd as it sounds, you can look back and say that was a gift. I mean, Dylan Alcott was a great example. Oh, well said. I mean, yeah. he doesn't want to walk. And, and look, he at doesn't the, want to walk. And look at the person he is today. He he does not want to walk. Yeah. He said. He, I read it the other day. He said. He said, "This is the greatest gift I've ever been given." Wow. Because if I was walking, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing in terms of inspiring millions of people. Other people I mean, in wheelchairs. Think of yeah. that. Yeah. Think of that. It's phenomenal. I mean, it? for heaven's sake. I mean, does that make sense? <laughs> Not really. A until you start thinking about it and understand that it does make sense. Yeah. So, you know, you can turn any any nasty situation around and You can't change the past. No, so. and you can't and you yeah. can't change it. There's no point. You yeah. know. I mean, we often have chats when we before we do our sports shows together yeah. about this sort of stuff. And, and, the, and it's easy to say, it's easy to articulate, to say, don't look back, you can't change the past, you know, look forward. It's not easy to do that. But if you discipline, <clears throat> if you discipline yourself to do that, then you're going to live a far better life. Yeah, well said. I mean, I wish I hadn't come in here for this interview, but there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, that. yeah, that's right. Exactly. I mean, I, yeah. I've done it now. It's been recorded. <laughs> you know, I mean, Rory's over there for whatever reason, smiling and sniggering. I mean, really, do I need to be here? No, no, not not not, not at all. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a good way to live your life. Yeah. Well, we'll leave it there, Mark Ace, and thanks so much for joining us today on Legends of Bevo and being so honest, you know, with your situation with mental health. And I'm sure there's people out there that have been watching or listening today that will take a lot from that. And also, you're sharing some great stories about your media career as well. And, and we look forward to, to seeing where it leads from here. Thanks, Bevo.